And we ask you, Lord, to speak to us through it and to help us to understand it. And that you would open it in such a way, Lord, that we might be changed and that we might hear you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's have a, a quick uh, introduction once again to where we are in the book of Acts. I think a couple of weeks ago Al said it was history, but more than history. And I think that's really helpful indeed. It's really helpful to know that this is history. These are historical events. These are things that really happened as the command of Jesus to take the good news, first of all from Jerusalem, and then outwards to Judea, to Samaria, and then out to the ends of the earth was being fulfilled. And it's something that's continuing today. So in a sense the chapters could go on being written through until our church here in Wheatley. Last week we saw how the message had reached Turkey, and this week we're looking at the events in Philippi, probably the first European city to receive the good news of Jesus, a Roman colony in the uh, area of Macedonia. I want us to focus today on the way that the good news can be spread, is spread, through difficult times and through suffering. The way in which this great plan to take the good news out across the whole world, Jesus' plan, empowered by the Holy Spirit, works its way out, not always, but oftentimes, through real challenge and difficulty. And it begins well for them in Philippi. It begins really well. Paul and Silas begin their mission in that city by going to a place of prayer outside the city gate. And there they meet a woman called Lydia. And Lydia, we're told, was a worshipper of God, but she wasn't a Christian. She hadn't understood and heard what Jesus had done and achieved. But when she heard the word, not only Lydia... But Lydia and her whole family believed. Can you picture the scene today where one of us goes down to the um, seating outside the Merry Bells with our lovely mug of coffee uh, served up by Brandon and we sit and we start to talk to that little group of people on that table and immediately one of them says, I believe. Come on. Let's go get my family. I want them all to hear. It starts really, really well. Lydia was clearly a key person in unlocking Philippi for Christ. And I just want to make a, a quick comment here that not infrequently the church grows through those key individuals with key contacts, key families, key people around them that take the message and run with it. It happened to us in a former church we were part of. We were called upon to get involved in some work with social housing nearby. The lady I'm thinking of concerned is on the staff of that church now. And she has ministered in that community as part of that community all the way through. And I know for some the struggle of how, how do you break through that little community at the school gate who all seem to know each other, who are all part of a group that's very hard to break into. Pray for a Lydia. Pray for one person that will be breaking into those groups around us that will make a difference. Let's ask it for Wheatley. And you'll see in Acts, actually, ordinary people, repeatedly really, who play their part in what happens. Good start, but then things take a different turn. Paul and Silas have to take a stand. I think we can say they have to take a stand for Christ. Let's spend a couple of minutes on this. We're called to reach out with the good news, but there are times alongside it where we might have to take a stand which goes against the flow. 
to such an extent that the consequences are painful, are difficult, are hard. For us, it's less likely to be physical and more likely to be psychological. And we'll see a little bit more about that. But there's this slave girl. And she's a walking billboard for them, isn't she? I mean, doesn't it seem really strange? She's calling out, these men are the servants of the Most High God, and they are telling you the way to be saved. You know, come on, Philippi, come and meet them. It seems like she's saying just the right things. But Paul has to take a decision. He recognises that this isn't coming from the right place. He recognises that it's coming from an evil spirit, not a good one. He realises that she needs to be delivered regardless of the consequences. So he calls the spirit out of her. And before they know it, her owners are whipping up the crowd and they're dragged to the marketplace and they're put in prison and they've been stripped and they've been whipped and they've been beaten. And that wasn't just a tap on the shoulder. This was agonising. This was serious stuff. Suffering because they'd stood up for what they knew to be right. Suffering because they stood up for the gospel. Suffering because they knew this slave girl was not speaking from Christ, from God. They knew they had to act. But what followed on, the consequence had to be faced. I think we can take a couple of things from this. First one is, are we prepared to stand up for Christ? Are we prepared to stand up for the gospel? Are we prepared to stand up for biblical truth when it's going to be tough, when the cause of the gospel is being harmed? And the second question is, are we prepared to stand with those globally who today are being persecuted and wounded and even killed for their faith in the global church. And what would that mean? So let's look at standing for the gospel for biblical truth in today's world. And it's a simple question. When did you last take a stand like that? A stand for what you believe to be God's way. It may be amongst us that there are areas and people where this is more likely than others. The young person in school who sticks their head above the parapet to maybe challenge something that's being said or that their friends are saying, and maybe faces mockery because they're a Christian. Maybe it's you today that has to take a stand like that. Maybe it's the student going into university who has to go against the flow of Freshers' Week in order to stand for Jesus during those very, very first, very challenging days. Maybe it's the teacher who has to somehow deal with a curriculum being pushed on them that denies the truth of God. Maybe it's a doctor or nurse who won't go along with some change in culture and practice. Maybe it's the politician, and we've seen this recently, haven't we? Who in effect deselects themselves because they've taken a stand for God. Now in the UK, these are unlikely to bring physical violence. Though I think we should recognise that in some faith communities, the young person who steps out to become a Christian may face that. It's more likely to be sleepless nights. It's more likely to be tribunals. It's more likely to be disciplinaries. It's more likely to be just that simple pain of the playground or the coffee room or the sixth form centre where you find yourself being mocked and laughed at and pushed around because you are standing for the good news. 
Let's be praying for people in those circumstances. All of those circumstances are real in different parts of the Christian church in Britain today. Those circumstances would be real in lived experience in this room. I think we must pause too to think about the persecuted church, people suffering for the name of Christ today. I don't know about you, sometimes I find it overwhelming. There is so much out there. You can name countries one after another, North Korea, Iran, and you can go on. A friend of ours is in Yemen, kept more or less within one compound because of the fear around them. Another friend goes into Iran on a regular basis to support the persecuted church there, at risk of his own safety and his own life every time he goes in. And yet his prayer letters are amazing. They're full of what God is doing. They're full of the church being built. They're full of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Full of God's amazing intervention and power in the growth of the church. We supported Pastor Prosper in Uganda over many years and we saw his people group being, their church being trashed by others only very recently. Suffering and persecution are not blocks to God's work and that's what we see here. So let's move on and see what happens next. So how do you get out of jail? Well, we had a wonderful example, didn't we, from Wormwood Scrubs very recently. I think it was Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, what you do is you get yourself a job in the kitchen, uh, and then when a delivery truck turns up, you climb underneath it, and uh, the first possibility you hop off, and then you hide out. So we got a bit of a lesson in that. But Paul and Silas weren't in the kitchen. They were in the most secure cell in the jail. They were locked in the stocks. And rather than plotting how they might get out, they were singing hymns, praying, and praising God. Now, I want to say that in my terminology, in human terms, they were not happy. This is not a moment of happiness. Their backs and their limbs would have been agonizing, and their situation in those stocks would have been far from comfortable. What it does mean is that they were trusting God who allowed them to be there, who had put them there as they took their stand. It was trust based on knowledge and on lived expectation, but above all, it was based on faith and trust and hope and joy and the knowledge that their saviour, Jesus, had suffered for them, for them to be where they are and to know what that had achieved. Now, I wonder what we would be singing today. If we were in circumstances like that, do you have a song that comes when you're in difficult times? Do you have something that you love to play? It used to be on the car CD player, if you still have one, that encourages you and helps you as you go into work? Something on your iPod shuffle? No, you don't have iPods anymore. They're old hat as well, aren't they? <laughs> I really am not into the technology. What would you be singing today? On Christ the solid rock I stand came to my mind. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. I know somebody who blasts out he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Saviour loves me so. He will hold me fast. What's your song? You need a song. It's right to have songs that you sing in moments of both joy and in moments of trouble. Having your own hymn book, you don't need the shuffle. You need it here. You need that song as they had that song. One thing we can be sure of, as Paul and Silas prayed and sang, they also wanted everyone in the prison to hear about Jesus. 
So maybe their songs and hymns were teaching a little bit about the Saviour that they loved. They weren't pointing to themselves. They were pointing to God. Now we see the power of God through suffering. And two things happen, and both are the expression of the power of God. First, there's the earthquake. It's the most targeted earthquake that I think you can probably think about. It doesn't flatten the city. We don't read that next day everything was devastated. It doesn't even flatten the prison, so that it falls on them all and kills them all. This is an amazingly targeted earthquake where God's power shakes that prison sufficiently that the doors come open and the chains fall off. That is a miracle, isn't it? That in itself is a miracle. And it doesn't just release Paul and Silas, it releases the other prisoners. Now, what would you have done next? I think I'd have run for it. I think the other prisoners would have run for it. But what happens next is Paul and Silas's opportunity to share the good news. It shows their compassion for the prisoners and for the jailer. What are your equivalents today when you're coming through suffering, when you're coming through hard times? Who can you sing your songs to? Who can hear when you don't run away, when things are really tough and when you stick with it? Perhaps they remember earlier in Acts when Peter was released from prison, Herod had the jailers killed. They're not going to let that happen. They stay. And this is God's next miraculous intervention. They share the good news with the jailer and his family, and they become Christians, and they are baptised. So we now know of two families in Philippi who are the start of that fledgling church in that town. Lydia's family and the jailer's family, and I'm sure they met very soon. We read that Paul, when the jailer asked, told the jailer that he needed to believe in the Lord Jesus and that he would be saved. Wouldn't you have loved to be there when Paul opened the word of God to that jailer? I wonder what he said. I wonder what he said that perhaps we don't know, it might have been an hour or two, it might have been ten minutes, that that jailer and all his family were saved. He just said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that you today? He'd have said, Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for you. He died so that your sins could be forgiven. He died so that you could be made right with God. He died so that that fracture between man and God could be bridged, could be put right. He came back from the dead. He came back from the dead to show you that we can live forever. And that what he'd achieved on the cross was complete and powerful. He sent his Holy Spirit so that you can follow him. He did all those things. I'm sure Paul did much better than me. I'm sure Paul did much better than me and perhaps he took longer. But if you don't know, if you don't know what Paul would have said, maybe there's a place to find out. There's the Bible, we hope in this new year there'll be a Christianity explored or similar running, a place to find out what that good news was that transformed those two families. Now, a few minutes, I just want to pick up on that theme of suffering for the gospel. I think there are two kinds of suffering, actually. There's one because we're Christians, because of the stands we take, because we seek to be true to God's word, because we... We're in a world that often rejects what Jesus says. There's a second kind that comes because we're humans. We live in a broken, fallen world. 
where sickness and disease, fraud, theft, accidents, broken relationships, bullying, school exams are part of our life and aging and death. They're two, the two are very different in cause, but both can have their place in the spread of the gospel. How we respond to suffering is often one of the most powerful witnesses. It was true in Acts, it's true for the persecuted church growing today, and it's true for us. People notice even small things. There's a witness in our words and our actions, even when we cannot see it. There's a witness in how we respond, how we go on trusting, even though things are really tough. We need to have the equivalent of Paul and Silas' prayers and hymns ready for hard times, but we also need to be just ready. Maybe it's that quiet word. Maybe it's a full-throated song. Maybe it's just a quiet whisper that others know we're holding on to Jesus, even though life is really, really hard. There's folk in the congregation at the moment who are facing serious illness and holding on to Jesus in the middle of that. Their words speak to us and speak to those around them. They haven't gone, given up Jesus because times are hard. They're not using him as a crutch because somehow that's what the world thinks that Christians have Christ for. They're looking forward to what Jesus has prepared for them. There's truth in that for, for all of us. Even the feeblest songs of faith can be used by the Holy Spirit to bring people to God. Let's remember that. Now let's just spend one moment looking at the consequences of Paul and Silas's suffering. The consequence was the birth and building of the church in Philippi. It's important to us because we're all engaged in the birth and building of a church here. So there's much to parallel. They got Lydia and her family. Who are our Lydias and our families? Now they've added on the jailer and his family. Probably some of the prisoners. After all, they were listening and, and they didn't run away. Maybe some of the prisoners heard the song and were added in. Paul and Silas, we read, had to leave pretty quickly. The authorities told them to go and they went. And yet a church grew. They had to get on with it. But so they did. And if we look at the letter that Paul wrote to the, to the Philippian church, we'll see some amazing things about that early church. We get some more names to add in. Euodia and Syntyche, who couldn't agree with each other. Epaphroditus and Timothy, who brought Paul help. Different people with different roles, building the church and spreading the good news. But Paul was full of praise for this little fledgling church. Philippians 1 verse 3 says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. These new believers didn't mess around. They didn't have faith but no actions. They got on with partnering Paul in his ministry. A church reaching out to churches, even though it was so young, ministering with him in the gospel, spreading the good news to the whole world. Churches going on and building churches. Philippians 2, verse uh, 13, we read, or verse, let's read from verse 12 onwards, perhaps makes more sense. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. As you always obey, not only in my presence, but now in my ab absence. Whether Paul was there or not, 
They kept true to the teaching of the word of God. They were obedient to him, even though they were such a young church. And then Philippians 4, verse 10 and, and onwards at verse 14. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Then down at verse 14, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. They were a supporting, giving church. They cared about Paul and they cared about other churches right from the beginning, sending gifts out to support him, supporting in his missionary work, spreading outwards. And now as he writes this letter, sending aid to him in Rome. Pictures of what God did through two men willing to suffer for the gospel. Pictures of one of the most important things through all history. Say that again, one of the most important things through all history, the planting and building of churches. Think of our parallel here. If you're part of Wheatley Community Church, you're called to build the church here. You're called to be part of that building. And it may be through suffering. And it may be through challenge, and it may be through difficulty, and it may mean we have to give things up, and it may mean that we have to stand out, and it may mean that we have to follow a path of sacrifice. And it makes me ask, who will be our Lydia's? Who will be our jailers? Who will be our Timothy and Epaphroditus? Taking the word of God building the church and then building other churches as we seek to follow through and to serve. Now, I want us to flow straight through in a way into communion now. Because I want us, as we take communion, to think about that sense that we are part of that flow from that very first church in Philippi, I want us to be remembering that Lydia and her family will have taken communion, perhaps not quite as we do, but in obedience to God, in that very early church, they would have shared the bread and the wine together. I want us to think as we come to communion too that we remember as part of what we do that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered that we might be saved. The bread and the wine speak to us of the fact that the church and our church my salvation and your salvation were born through suffering. The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself to go to the cross, body broken, blood shed, whipped, scourged, crown of thorns placed on his head, mocked and insulted, that the church might go from Jerusalem, from Judea to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And it's still going He's going now. I want us, as we share, to be thinking about not just the communion that we share within the fellowship today, but our communion with the persecuted church today, with the people who will be taking communion in secret, in fear, in hope that they aren't discovered, and for the people who won't be able to take communion because they're in a prison cell and nobody's going to bring them the bread and the wine. I want us to think today that what we are a part of is vast. 
won by Jesus Christ. And even today, you might want to think as we come to communion of perhaps one individual that you know who might be suffering locally for their faith, perhaps verbal abuse or hard times, or might be suffering because you know that they're in a prison cell somewhere for their faith. And I want us, as we come to communion, yes, we must focus on Christ. That's what it really is about. But as we focus on Christ, let's begin also to remember that he was our great example 